are today. <laughs> I apologize to David that we were unable to provide him with the Florida experience, but in many regards, this is a Florida winter. Let's, let's be honest, we're not dying. So we do thank you very much for joining us. My name is Lynn Hogan. I'm Assistant Provost and Director of the Office of Critical Thinking Initiatives here at Florida State University. On behalf of the university, President Thrasher and Provost McCrory, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this keynote address of this year's Critical Thinking Symposium entitled Dig Digital Citizenship. In addition to the live audience here in Tallahassee, we want to welcome those who are joining us via live stream, particularly our colleagues at Panama City, Florida, and at our international sites. Um, this, this event brings to close a series of talks, panels, and student activities and discussions about digital citizenship and what that means in today's world. Obviously, FSU has been concerned about critical thinking skills development since we opened our doors in 1851. However, over the past five years, Florida State put forth a concerted effort to increase those skills among our students. We did this because we wanted our graduates to be prepared to deal with the challenges of succeeding in the information-rich society in which we now live. To achieve the, the goal of enhancing these important skills, FSU faculty from throughout the institution incorporated more critical thinking activities and modules into courses. To date, over 35,000 students have participated in critically thinking enhanced courses. Of course, we all know this, that we don't spend all of our time in a classroom and neither do our students. They learn outside. And so we wanted to make sure as we advanced our critical thinking agenda that we um, involve the co-curricular here at Florida State University, of which we have a great deal going on and which we have some very valuable partners. The Critical Thinking Symposium was one of those elements. Last year, I approached Mike Meth of the University Libraries to talk about the possibility of putting together a symposium. I learned a valuable lesson at that point in time. Ask a librarian and hold on. <laughs> what for me was a simple day of talks, discussions, blossomed into a multiple day uh, program that included multiple audiences from the university, multiple audiences from the community, and involved the talks, the panels, the student activities, Jeopardy. That was not on my radar screen when we talked about that. So it, 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 this is our second critical thinking symposium, and I doubt seriously that it's going to be our last. Of course, when you do an event like this, it doesn't happen on its own. You've got a team of experts behind the scenes who are making it run. And I want to take this opportunity to thank those who were participating in the planning and the execution. First, a big thank you to the library leadership, Dean Etchner, Etchmeyer, Mike Meth, and Beth Boatwright for supporting your staffs and for your direct involvement as we did this. In addition to the libraries, we had representatives from the offices all over campus, including the Office of the Provost, the Oglesby Union, the Division of Student Affairs, University Communication, the Center for the Advancement of Teaching, the Graduate School, the Program for Instructional Excellence, Undergraduate Studies, the Innovation Hub, the Center for Undergraduate Research and in Academic Engagement, and the College of Communication Information and Information. I want to give a very special thank you to the people who were doing the work, particularly two colleagues from the libraries, Preeti Gorecki, I hope I got that right, and Lindsay Wharton. They were our co-chairs. <laughs> they did a phenomenal job. Also, special thanks go to Robin Brock, Tony Archer, Nikki Morris for doing a lot of, of the Herculean work that was necessary, and also special thanks to those who served on the committee. And if you were on the search committee, if you don't mind raising your hand so we can say thank you and recognize you for your efforts. <laughs> You were busy and I had a lot of Zoom meetings. That's all I've got to say. Now there's one bit of housekeeping before we move on to the keynote address. If you're watching this via live stream and you want to participate in the question and answer session that's gonna occur, please, and I make sure I got this right, tweet your questions to hashtag critical thinking 2020. Again, that's hashtag critical thinking 2020. We'll be monitoring that and getting those questions out. Given that this year's topic is digital citizenship, FSU's Chief Information Officer seems like a great choice to do the introduction of our guest speaker, and I think she is. Jane Livingston is 
I think she will say successfully, completing her first year as Associate Vice President for Information Technology Services here at Florida State University. In that role, she is responsible for the IT services and security for more than 50,000 faculty, staff, students, alumni, and retirees. Just a little bit of work. She has about 370 technology professionals working for her. I can tell you from sitting in, with me, in meetings with Jane, she doesn't sit still. She has had been very busy, and I think she's reinvigorated the technology community here at Florida State University. Prior to joining us here, Jane was at Yale University and was there for 13 years. During the last five years of her tenure there, she was Associate University CIO for Information Technology Services. She holds a bachelor's degree in history and women's studies from Wichita State University and a master's degree in information management from Syracuse University. So it's my pleasure to introduce Jane Livingston. Hi, everybody. I am delighted to be here to introduce our, um, our, our speaker. Um, so when, when, when Lynn asked me to um, come and talk to you, I, I was like, I'm, I'm so absolutely delighted to he be here to talk and to listen to the talk about digital citizenship. Digital, digital citizenship. <laughs> I'm gonna try again, I'm gonna take a breath. Digital citizenship and the, 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 the impact of ethics on, digital, on the digital world. So we all know technology's changed the world in the last, in particular in the last three decades, right? I mean, internet, iPhones, social media, they've all changed the way we perceive and interact with the world around us. But we now have to worry about how babies' brains are developing. That's what we were chatting about mm -hmm. before we um, started here today. You know, babies have iPads. They're, they're on iPhones. It's changing and rewiring the way we think as human beings, which is, you know, we don't really, it's, a, it's what did you call it, a large social experiment. <laughs> we, we, we don't even really know what the impact will be. And the pace of change is somewhat exhausting, even for me, who's a technology um, professional. I, um, I saw a funny meme online the other day that I thought I would share with you. It said that 20 years ago, the internet, the internet was an escape from reality. But today, reality is just an escape from the internet. And it's so true, right? We all dream about vacations where there's no cell phone coverage, where we don't have to answer our phones or think about the email that's piling up back at work. There are so many troubling things that are happening every day in the world, in the news, and many of them seem to be driven by the power of this unregulated force of unnature that we have unleashed on ourselves. There's a lot of uns in a word, in a sentence, right? Like, it's all kind of unintentional. We didn't intend to do any of this. And that intention, I think, is a really important part of what we're here to hear about today. Um, I'm really delighted to be introducing David. He's an attorney, a former professor, and a technology ethicist. We need more people like David in the world who are out there thoughtfully engaging and helping us to drive necessary change in both policy and technology and the way we're approaching thinking about the intersection of those things. David is a speaker, a writer, an advocate, he is not selling us a new widget. He is asking us to slow down and be intentional, intentional about our engagement with technology and helping us to think through the ramifications of our choices. I, I, I want you to all welcome him with me. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, James. And since you mentioned that, uh, the idea of the uns, right? Yeah. Unintentional consequences of technology. That's a huge theme right now. And a lot of the work that I do and the, and the people that I surround myself with in this community that is growing is actually focused on the unintentional consequences because it's a little rich right now when you have uh, tech executives saying, well, I couldn't have foreseen this. Because the flip side of that is, well, one, there were a lot of people who did foresee this, but two, that also means that we should be having these conversations. If we're really surprised by these quote unquote unintentional consequences of technology, what if we could lower that by being more intentional about the design and the deployment of technologies and the safeguards and the procedures that we create? So as Jane was mentioning, kind of the issue of digital wellness, a huge space. 
but that also deals with the idea of etiquette, balance, and then how tech companies react to that. There's a lot of great articles talking about how a lot of people within Silicon Valley send their uh, kids to Waldorf school models that don't actually incorporate a lot of technology. So there's a lot of debate on this, this issue. But I'm with you for about the next hour, and we're talking about ensuring a bright tech future, right? And I say that because, hey, we might get a little dark because there's a lot of, a lot of debate about where tech is going, right? But I want to end, our goal is to end not only with this thoughtful discussion, critically thinking about some of the issues, debating it with your friends and your family and your frenemies, debating with anybody you see in Florida. But it should be more about incorporating all of our ideas, right? Because something that I think doesn't get talked about enough is that this is not a tech problem, right? incorporate that in, in some of the slides, but it's something to reiterate because I know when I started out, because again, I have a background as an attorney and educator, and about 2012 when I started doing a lot of writing and speaking on a lot of these topics, if somebody sees tech in the, in the phrase of your description, they sometimes think, like I, I had one, one uh, lady show up one time and she said, so can you help me build a website? Can you, can you fix my computer? And I said, no, actually, that's, that's not my background. I'm not talking about the newest gadget. I'm talking about what is that gadget doing to eye contact, our ability to relate to one another, our ability to understand and critically think or not, right? Emerging technology and social media has altered the way we love, learn, right? Even how we die, how we express ourselves, how we form our reality, the human condition, the human psyche. That's a big deal. And everything that ties together what I do and what we're talking about today is that it's such a big deal that it behooves us to say we can't just leave it up to one type of person. Right? We want them to be more ethical and more involved, but it, it seems like a wrong path to say here's something that is altering the course of human history. Let's just leave it up to one part of the country and one country in the world and a certain type of person who fits a certain type of demographic. It's incredibly dangerous, right? What we're building, since it affects how we communicate with one another, what we even form as reality or truth, how we think, because it's so important, we need to ensure that we bring in transdisciplinary, as the talk was talking about yesterday, like transdisciplinary thinking people, different backgrounds, different types of thinking, right? It's so important. This is not a tech issue. So let's start dark, and then we're going to end, hopefully, on a positive note, right? When we think about <coughs> a bright tech future, we also need to think about where we don't want to go. And that's where sci-fi has been great, right? Because they've laid out these potential futures. I mean, think about that, right? Like, you can take anything in modern history, like the Titanic. You say, well, did anybody predict the iceberg? Well, yeah, they, they actually did. There was a book where it predicted, you know, here's this iceberg, and here's something that looks like the Titanic hitting it, right? So a lot of times, we need to look at where we don't want to go to understand how we can build safeguards to prevent that. Uh, there was an article a couple, a couple weeks ago in the New York Times talking about this uh, AI company called Clearview that was dealing a lot with facial recognition. And there was a very disturbing quote in it where one of the uh, investors of the company said something akin to, well, this may lead to a dystopia, but, <laughs> you know, what can you do? <laughs> Laws, regulation, getting people involved. There's a lot we can do. So if there's one thing that personally I completely reject, it's the idea that the future is just inevitable. And something that I personally get a kick out of is that we sometimes have a hard time separating uh, what's being pitched to us, which is usually to sell a product, versus the fact that we as a society determine how things get embedded. 
We as a society determine what's legal, what's not. Right? The norms of our behavior, that's important. And I think sometimes we, we think that it's just inevitable. Well, just privacy is just eroding. Or this is just how people are. No. You were talking about us. That's why the, the organization that I run based in uh, New York is called All Tech is Human. And that name comes from the, the feeling that we need to reassert a level of agency. Right? All technology that we're developing and deploying, it's coming from us. Therefore, obviously, it should be subservient in some fashion to us as opposed to the flip uh, of that. And that's a lot of what we're talking about. So Minority Report, if we have a vision of a dystopian future, uh, have people seen that movie? It's also a Philip K. Uh, Dick book, right? That's dealing with uh, predictive policing. Well, sure enough, that's obviously some of the concerns that we have, right? We famously have the Orwellian idea of George Orwell, 1984. That Big Brother is watching us. We're, you know, we can't go anywhere. We're gonna, it's, it's eroding our freedom of mind. And well, sure enough, obviously, fa facial recognition is a major, major topic of discussion, right? What I'm trying to point out there is that a lot of what we've talked about of what could happen is happening to a certain extent, which, which elevates the importance of what we need to do. And one of the main points of our discussion is that there is a major difference between how fast we are developing these technologies and how slow, oftentimes, we're able to consider the impact of that technology. And frankly, people can kind of exploit the fact that there's this gulf between consideration and creation. Uh, even that example I mentioned with Clearview uh, AI, even though that's something that you read it and you're saying, ah, how can that be allowed? How is that legal? How is that possible? Well, uh, oftentimes we can kind of exploit the fact that it's not written yet, right? Uh, oftentimes somebody might act in a gray area because it's waiting for that to be a bright black line. And that's a lot of what we're discussing. But to make this uh, you know, hyper-relevant, especially along the idea of critical thinking, it's a funny, funny world uh, we have going right now. Uh, unfortunately, with uh, you know, all the pandemic discussion, there's now talk about an infodemic, right? That there's so much misinformation uh, around, around this that it's obviously creating a lot of problems. People are trusting wrong advice. Like there was this, uh, you know, word was spreading that if you ate garlic, that that could, could prevent you from getting this, and that's not true. But the point is, this showcases how far we're off the initial path of what uh, Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web 30 years ago, uh, envisioned. Right? And I say this too because from my own personal history and uh, motivation for getting involved in this space, if you will, is that in my formative years, right, I, I recall being in, in high school and then reading about well, the information superhighway, that it didn't matter if you were in Timbuktu or Kathmandu, that you could have all of the world's libraries, all of information at your fingertips. Wasn't that going to be great? The fact that you could break down barriers meant that we would see that there's limited differences between cultures. And the fact that we would have access to all this rich information meant that we would be elevating conversation. We'd be elevating our knowledge and our intelligence. The web and the information superhighway was supposed to make us smarter. That's the idea, right? That's the goal, that's the hope. But here we are in 2020, and some of the hottest discussions are, is the earth flat, right? <laughs> Sorry, it's not. But th that is hilarious and hilariously sad at the same time because that's the opposite 
of what this was setting out to do, right? This is why even companies now, because of this social pressure, are getting involved and saying, okay, well, this isn't a good thing. We don't want people dying because they're getting misinformation. This isn't just, as a couple years ago, everybody was joking around silly cat videos. This isn't just silly cat videos. Democracy <laughs> and, and, and speech and information, that's at stake. That's, that's a big deal, right? So a lot of this discussion is getting into this idea of as a society, we're realizing the importance of what we are creating and the safeguards that we either create or, or don't have, the regulation. And there is a massive interplay that's occurring between us as individuals and our ability or potentially right now inability to affect the process and then also how industry operates, the pressure that they receive or don't receive, the regulation that happens or doesn't happen, and then media. What's the media's role in this? All of those are interplaying. I say that because one of the most common questions I get is somebody will say, well, David, then, then who's the blame? Right? Like that's, a, that's a common media question. Who's the blame? So is this... Is this Facebook's fault? Or is this because users should read the terms of service? And the answer is that it's everyone, right? We're all uh, interplay. We're all affecting the other part. Because the more that the media focuses on educating the general public about some of the issues, then the general public is better understanding of this and then pushes pressure on the legislative branch, which then creates laws, which then makes things that we're Legal now, illegal, which changes industry. All these parts are pushing one another. And that's something that we don't usually uh, think about. We always focus on one part. Even as Jane was mentioning with uh, digital wellness, right? how we use our smartphones. Uh, I've been involved in that space. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about quote unquote tech addiction and early on, uh, it was always a focus of, well, then just put away your, your phone. This is a willpower issue. Whereas then you started getting into, yeah, but isn't it design of the product? And what, shouldn't we also have the right to change the design of the product if we're realizing that it's creating a societal issue, right? We're about critical thinking, right? And one way that we really need to conceive of this is that it's a complex problem that demands a comprehensive solution that involves multiple stakeholders, right? But just to point this out, I was thinking about this last night, and I was like, wow, it's, it's kind of hilarious, but again, hilariously sad, that uh, we have misinformation about a virus going viral, right? Uh, this, is where, <laughs> this is where, one, you should think about the fact that even the terms we utilize, like viral, viral media, meme, they're all based on science, right? Of how, how something spreads, like a contagion. So this is where I always say, WTF, right? What the facts? You gotta say what the facts every time I see this. And then Lynn, just for you, don't forget, critical thinking, 2020. But the point is, we sometimes need to recognize the absurdity of where we're at, right? We are off the vision of where we need to be. But the reason why, you know, uh, I'm still an optimist and we started with the description of ensuring a bright tech future is because you still need to have, hopefully, a non-defeatist type of feeling that, well, then how do we get more people on board, right? We have so many issues over the years that we as a society have struggled with, but we've come together to propose solutions and then iterate on those solutions, right? So just pointing that out, we've gone from information superhighway to infodemic. That's why we're doing this. I point this out. Somebody know Ron Popeil? <laughs> Said it and forget it. The reason why, and I wasn't sure of the uh, you know, appeal of Ron Popeil, 
But uh, that seems to be something that has happened, that so many times when you talk to technologists, and the viewpoint that I'm bringing is that I have a pretty crossover experience where day to day I'm dealing with organizational uh, folks, uh, industry, advocacy groups, so a diverse group of people. And one of the things that I've noticed is technologists oftentimes are thinking about creating something and then just throwing that out in the world and then it's fine. Right, and even a lot of the terms we use to describe tech are based on this potential misnomer. We say, well, tech is just a tool. It's just like a hammer. You use it the wrong way, you know, you can build a house or you can hurt somebody with it. <clears throat> well, that's kind of true, but the hammer doesn't change my condition of what I think about the hammer. It doesn't alter my, my reality. So we need to start thinking, we can't just set something in motion and then just forget about it. We constantly have to say, what are the different potential futures? What's the dystopian future with it? And how do I, how do I prevent that? Right? Because going back to the unintended consequences, if that's something that we fail to consider, then we should start considering them. Right? We should start <laughs> talking to people who write sci-fi books. We should start talking to historians who say, well, this is very similar. Right? As new as this seems, these are usually dealing with age-old issues about equity and power. Right? When you really boil down a lot of these issues. Right? When we get into what is going on with the web and information, right? specifically about uh, what's happening now with trying to tackle misinformation, you'll notice an underlying fight about what the web should be. And actually, if you really dig, dig uh, into the founding of the web, some of the earliest philosophies and documents really took a very kind of libertarian uh, viewpoint. There's a famous cyberspace manifesto that came out uh, in 1997, where it basically said, laws don't apply to us, we are people of cyberspace, we're kind of our own world or country. And I think that's what a lot of the fight is going on about. Right? What is the web and what should it be? And, and what type of environment happens? Also, this idea of the marketplace of ideas. So much of how, specifically, we set up social media companies and the laws that, that apply to social media companies is based on this idea that, of course, we can set it and forget it because guess what? Nobody's going to believe that the Earth is flat is 2020. They have information. They have good information. They could just look it up. Wait a minute. If you can Google everything, then, then why would these conspiracy theories be floating around? They can just fact check it. That is not obviously working. It's something about the system is, is, is breaking, uh, and they actually have some interesting studies about that. And what they're finding, as this MIT 2018 study found, is that unfortunately, false information will spread faster. It has more of a contagion or viral effect. And a lot of that, too, is how we set up social media. Right? Social media companies, uh, at the end of the day, are an ad-based platform. And as an ad-based platform, the collection and uh, how you converse is usually built around kind of appealing to the people who are funding it. Right? And also, because it needs to show you more ads, it has a kind of a perverse incentive to ex keep you on the platform longer, right? It's not about selling you one thing that you either enjoy or don't. It's about kind of the uh, attention uh, economy type of, type of idea. So that's kind of what we're struggling with there, right? So as I mentioned, but I think it's worth repeating, the focus of so much of this is how then, if we're talking about critical thinking, how then can we start saying, 
these aren't these aren't something, these aren't just tech issues just left to, to a tech company in a state far away. Instead, these are just like any other issue that we might get involved in the political process. I really think if we're looking ahead to the next couple of years, what we're going to see is a greater integration of how we talk about tech issues and then how we're just thinking about social issues and then incorporating that more into the general political process, right? <laughs> kind of as I point out, but just with a visual, this friction, and this is where then I kind of get into a little bit with uh, what I do with Autex Human, but the point is the reason why I want to focus on consideration is because a lot of people fall into a trap when they talk about um, tech and safeguards. Because what will happen is they'll say something like, yeah, you know, it's, it's too bad what's being released on fill in the blank type of technology that maybe we're debating how it's going to be used, enforced, how it affects our privacy. And then the next line will be, <clears throat> but you know, American ingenuity, you can't slow down innovation, right? That's always the line. So the point is, <clears throat> What if it's not about necessarily slowing down innovation? What if part of the problem is that our consideration is inadequately slow in order to consider, consider that? Right, you take any type of technology. We're talking a lot about drones, and we had dancing with drones in the, in the talk yesterday. Well, drones, right, there's famously a technology that got out there, then people started using them, then they started flying into things, and then, and then planes and pilots started getting upset, and they said, what are the rules on this? And they said, oh, we need some rules on this. Uh, the point is, we're starting to realize that we can release something and the general public can adopt it before we've had a chance to say, how should it be adopted? What are the safeguards, right? So there's countless examples of that happening. And what we're really trying to do is speed up this type of consideration. Here's another important part of the process that I think it's, it's worth mentioning. We are all not on the same wavelength. Okay? And I'm going to repeat that because it's something we constantly forget. Uh, I remember being on a panel a couple days after Cambridge Analytica uh, scandal broke, uh, you know, for affecting Facebook and then realizing how information was, was being shared with a friend of a friend on their platform. And I remember the other person who was on the, the panel with me said, well, I, I don't, I mean, it's a big deal, but didn't everybody already know this is how this works? Didn't the general public already know about like retargeted ads? And the point was no, right? What happens a lot of times, and I see this firsthand uh, within an industry, is that oftentimes you can take a non-answer as, uh, as, as an answer, right? So, so if you said to your significant other, hey, you know, uh, we're going to go to see this uh, Ryan Reynolds movie. And then they don't say anything, oh, okay. they didn't say no, right? So, you know, sometimes, sometimes you set up a question where a non-answer can be an affirmative, right? So that's similar to a lot of what has happened within tech. We've developed so much uh, emerging technology and we put it out into the world. And then from a technologist standpoint, we assume that because there is not a backlash, the lack of a backlash is akin to a thumbs up. That because people didn't complain about privacy concerns, then they don't have privacy concerns. And that used to be a big threat a couple years ago, right? Privacy is dead. Nobody cares about privacy. New article, millennials don't care about privacy, right? There's a lot of these articles. Uh, and then you look at the last couple years, uh, it turns out privacy is dead, long live privacy, right? So it's just a different type of formation of an understanding of, of privacy, right? I also like to point out, I think one of the reasons why uh, we talk about ethics 
in technology is partly because of our own frustration of the lack of, of laws around it. As yeah, so I'll talk about, one of the, actually the most consequential law affecting social media companies is the uh, Communications Decency Act of 1996. I'd like to emphasize, and if I could bold something, I'd bold the 1996 because that is before Google was founded, and that's well before Facebook was founded. So we should sit on that and say, the most important law that dictates how social media, which is how we're receiving our news and talking to people, was written before social media. Uh, therein lies the problem, right? And I think that's why and a lot of times we're talking about the ethics of technology. Because we need to also think, oftentimes that acts as kind of a canary in the coal mine of, of what might in the future be illegal once we come to kind of a, a mutual understanding as a society. You, you think of massively cultural upheaval types of issues over the years in this country, right? Uh, let's say around like women's suffrage and slavery. Well, when both of those were legal, right? When, when uh, let's say when women didn't have the right to vote, there was obviously the discussion around, well, is this ethical? Is this unethical? What are the, you know, what's, what's the ramifications of this? So I think that's a lot of the discussions that we're having today around technology and <coughs> ethics and, and its impact, we're realizing the significance of a lot of this, right? So the perspective I'm bringing, just so uh, you know what lens is coming through, I, I run, like I said, this organization, All Tech is Human, in New York. We've been holding ethical tech summits uh, throughout the country in uh, San Francisco, Seattle, and New York, and focusing on these four pillars, and I mention them because it's connected with this overall uh, focus that we're going to have, right? How can we, if we're going to have a bright tech future, how can we increase public participation? What are the best practices? We're seeing this a lot because we have a lot of media attention saying Silicon Valley needs to be more unethical. But oftentimes technologists will then reach out and say, okay, I get it, but what does it mean to be ethical? Like what's the best practice for that? Where is that line? What type of guidance do I have? Right? There's a lot of structure that actually needs to happen. Uh, I remember I was talking to somebody who was just hired uh, as a chief data ethicist uh, at, a, at a startup. And he, he said, well, when he got hired, and it was actually a background, uh, this is a startup in New York, and his background as a philosophy professor uh, in Colorado. And, and then he got this job. And, he, and I said, well, where did your company have a job description? And he said, they didn't. And that's why you know, he found all things human. Uh, so there's a lot that needs to coalesce, right? And that's also why I think it's, it's an exciting time because truly a lot of these issues, the solutions are unformed, which means that we're at a pivotal juncture in society where we're trying to set up what should the rules be. And it's a big fight that is going on. Right, so that's why we mentioned informing policymakers and also elevating the uh, media narrative. And I say that too because uh, one of the things that, that I've noticed is that we oftentimes forget to include the media in a lot of these factors, but uh, so many of the movements that have happened usually happen around media attention. Right? Like, you take any issue. I mean, Harvey Weinstein, just con uh, convicted, two counts. Well, it's not like people didn't know, but then after the New York Times did a big expose a couple years ago, media has a major impact on our societal behavior. It kicks things into, into action. So the way we like to think about it uh, with All Tech is Human is that again, not just a tech problem. We might have a tech problem, but we need a societal solution. Every topic you can actually break down usually into technology, education, policy, and participation. And I say this because one of the most common 
uh, questions that I get is that somebody will say, wow, I you know, really want to get involved, but you know, I'm not a coder. It's, the world doesn't need more coders. The, the world right now needs more, more thoughtfulness around how we can actually deal with these issues, right? Or maybe more thoughtful coders as well. So that would be the in-between. But the point is, this is not an area that only needs to be filled by one type of thinking. And I, and I, repeat, it. I repeat that because we forget that. And, and the way we even frame it. And frankly, a lot of that is also uh, visual imagery, right? And that was part of the presentation uh, yesterday, right? When you say, quick, think of a tech leader, and then everybody says, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, as was in the slides. Well, the reason why that can be um, problematic is that it's not sending a signal to somebody who's saying, well, wait a minute, I'm coming about it from an artist, or I'm a designer, I'm a philosopher, and I'm thinking about this. I mean, we have technology that's altering the way we think about life and death. You think that we should just leave this up to coders? I mean, seriously. Don't do that. The, the, <laughs> no, I, and, and, and frankly, uh, one of the personal motivations I had where it really kind of hit me over the head of um, how important this issue is, is I remember a bunch of years ago, uh, you know, having, having Facebook, and this was before Facebook was pushing to mobile. And um, I had this friend request, and that was before, before you instantly could just click it. And then I had a friend call me up, and this was a friend, uh, Jared, and, and then I heard that he committed suicide. But I still had the friend request. And it was kind of jarring in the sense that you're playing with our conception over finality, right? And this even happened yesterday. Uh, I had the same thing. Somebody who was dead said, wish this person a happy birthday. Send him good thoughts, right? We sometimes forget that we're altering how people relate to the world. Again, it's a big deal. All right, to add a little levity, <laughs> Some of you may have seen this, but I think it's important because if we bring up policymakers, we need to assess where we currently are. Uh, so this is a, uh, a good clip. This was done two years ago, and this is right after Cambridge Analytica. Mark Zuckerberg uh, was called uh, in front of the Senate. Mr. Zuckerberg, I remember well your first visit to Capitol Hill back in 2010. You spoke to the Senate Republican High Tech Task Force, which I chair. You said back then that Facebook would always be free. Is that still your objective? Senator, yes. There will always be a version of Facebook that is free. It is our mission to try to help connect everyone around the world and to bring the world closer together. In order to do that, we believe that we need to offer a service that everyone can afford and we're committed to doing that. Well, if so, how do you sustain a business model in which users don't pay for your service? Senator, we run ads. <laughs> I see. That's great. Hey, <laughs> so, Thanks for checking out so there you go. YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on yeah. the button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital ex Yep. <laughs> So you see there that there's oftentimes a lack of understanding about what tech is and what social media companies are. And a lot of that, again, was, was even how we, we framed it. Hey, it's just a bunch of, of young people who are just trying to change the world. They don't care about money. Right? That was the original kind of, kind of pitch. And now we're starting to realize, no, these are ad-based models that, you know, they have shareholders who are, who are trying to extract more, more wealth, right? So how is that going to play out? 
when those are also the same systems of communication we use to get news and spread news. There is oftentimes a misalignment because on one hand we say, well, wait a minute, this is a utility. Right? We treat this as if it's, wait a minute, this is my speech. Right? Whereas a company is saying, I'm a company, I can kind of do what I, do what I want. So I think that's where, in the future, we're going to alter our kind of relationship and understanding of how we consider these companies, right? They might have to be some hybrid type of almost quasi-governmental uh, type, of, type of relationship, just because we're starting to realize the impact. So I like to refer to this as the symbiosis of safety, this idea that it's this interrelationship that I mentioned. But just as a quick kind of example, uh, Think about safe driving, right? I mention that because we oftentimes have a tough time conceiving of, of this kind of multi-dimensional uh, type, of, type of impact, right? We say we care about safe driving, right? We do. But when you jumped in a car today, on one hand, safe driving can seem like an individual decision, right? You could be a safer driver because you're awake, you're not on your phone, you're, you know, you're looking straight ahead, you're not distracted, you're following the rules, 10 and two. But it's not as simple as that, right? Because safe driving, if we care about car safety, we also think, well, what about the safety of the car? Does the car have Airbags? How was that car tested? Wait a minute. They're driving on a road and there's potholes. Who's fixing the potholes? Right? Right there, you've had a combination of saying you needed to have laws and regulation and safety and debate and, gov and governmental bodies involved. You have this idea that when we're thinking about tech that it's just an individual. It's, it's myself and my phone. Right? Whereas, in fact, it's, it's kind of this interrelationship that is happening where in order to build a, a bright tech future, we need to start saying, okay, well, similar to driver safety, what's the education we're having? What's the digital citizenship uh, type, of, type of training? How are we incorporating that into to schools? Right? You had a driver's ed, but we give people phones without saying, how do we operate? these phones uh, in a way that benefits society, right? Mention uh, Ralph Nader, unsafe at any speed, because that's something we oftentimes forget, is that everybody today, when they jump in their car, they put on their seatbelt. But for the longest time, <laughs> the seatbelt was not mandated. And the reason, from an industry perspective, was, well, this is going to raise our, our uh, cost. In addition, there was also even kind of the other type of argument of saying, well, if it's actually more dangerous to drive a car, then on one hand, you'd be safer if you had that danger because, because it's a higher risk. So then you'd be more kind of cognizant of your, of your surroundings. So the reason why I mention that is because we oftentimes like to think that we're just kind of fixed in a current moment. Whereas in fact, it's usually through advocacy and communicating ideas differently and getting different groups involved in something that's going to actually alter the course of, of history. So if we focus specifically on social media, again, so many issues that we could talk about with emerging technology impacting us as a society, but I think from, uh, from a perspective that, that we can all kind of have that shared experience with, uh, Facebook, Twitter, other social media, probably the most familiar. So the way I like to think about where they are uh, currently is, is right here, right from, from The Simpsons, uh, in between a rock and a hard place. And, and let's explain why, right? And this is, again, why we want to point out that these are complex problems. And we cannot necessarily just have knee-jerk reactions to say, well, then we should have, then we should tag everything that's, that's, uh, that's false, 
Uh, or maybe the, the uh, platform should just take it down. That might be true, but it also needs to have an understanding and debate around how would that happen? Who is judging what is truth and what's not truth? What's the transparency about that system of judging? What's the impact when something is even labeled as potentially false? Because that's the unfortunate part about trying to tackle misinformation, is what they find is a lot of, bless you, a lot of uh, conspiracy theorists, when they are triggered with, with an indication that something is false, it, instead, of, instead of it being the, you know, ah, face palm, I, I can't believe I almost fell for that, it tends to be, ah, this is part of the conspiracy. Look at this, look at this establishment media. Of course they want to tell me that this isn't real. The plot thickens, right? And maybe it's exciting. So in between a rock and a hard place, what is happening is that you have major social media companies that are, are being told two strong, compelling arguments, right? They're being told that the way it's at right now, it's not sustainable. So we need to do something about hate speech and misinformation. We need to deal with this. We need to decrease toxic behavior online. But the problem is what happens when they do? And also, are they in the position to make that call, right? Can they actually make that, that call? The way we need to think about it is we oftentimes like to think of platforms as being a public square, but I'll explain a little bit why they are not, right? So we want these platforms to do the right thing, but we have to, as a society, debate what that right thing is. And that's why if you look at some of the current movements of what social media companies are doing, they are creating, uh, like Facebook, for example, is creating a task force that is uh, going to create precedent around what is appropriate, what's inappropriate speech. And a couple, about a year ago, it got a lot of media attention. They said, oh, there's going to be a Facebook Supreme Court. And a lot of people scratched their head. They said, what, a Facebook Supreme Court? Why does this make any sense? The reason why it, it makes some sense is that when you're in a public square and you say something that is inappropriate, the reason why it's inappropriate is because we created a law that says, here's what is allowable speech. And then we've created understanding that political speech is in the center of that type of speech and what you can and cannot say. And then through the court system, right, we, we say this is allowable and this is not allowable. And then that system is transparent. So you can kind of interrogate that system of understanding. And because governmental bodies, right, because these elected officials are kind of a stand-in for us, they have some level of uh, kind of moral authority to make these decisions. So part of the issue of what's going on is that social media companies have been giving a lot of power, right? But what do they do with this power? I would argue they don't, frankly, even want this power because it comes with a lot of tremendous amount of uh, complication. So it's, we're at a point where large companies have a power, they're doing a lousy job with it, and they don't even want it. So we as a society are struggling with saying, how do we adjust to this? How do we incorporate a better type of system, right? That's what I'm talking about with the public square. So if you really look at what's going to happen most likely in the, in the future in this space, we're going to start saying, okay, well, if we want to make this statement more true that Twitter is a public square, then shouldn't our ability to interrogate the system and understand what's appropriate and what's not, shouldn't that be similar to then my relationship to an actual public square, right? We've got to have some, uh, you know, better, better type of relationship with it. 
Also, uh, as I'm kind of nearing, uh, nearing the end, so I'm going to go a little quicker, we're going to come back to section 230 because that's going to come up a lot in the next year or two. There's even a lot of debate right now of whether they're going to start chipping away at it. Right? It's always a trade-off. As we've moved more of our lives <clears throat> from offline to online, what has happened is we've transferred our lives there, but we haven't necessarily transferred the safeguards and understanding about how we communicate and how we relate to one another in those spaces. Right? I think I'll just switch over to this quote and then uh, have another kind of closing one. I really like this quote from Sherry Turkle, right? Every technology asks us to confront human values. It's a good thing because it causes us to reaffirm what they are. So we've gone through, in the last couple of years, a major amount of disruption. But really, in one respect, what it's done is it's caused us to actually say, how should we develop these technologies, right? How should we deploy them? What types of systems should we, should we make? I think I'll just go to my closing, although I will quickly point out one of the uh, friction points with how we're viewing these is that you have different types of thinkers, right? And that oftentimes, I mean, this is a little bit what a Jurassic Park was trying to get at, but engineers, can I, right? Can you build a dinosaur? Can you make a dinosaur from ember? Versus, well, should I? And then you have law that usually comes in with a more bright line of here's what you can't do or here's what you must do. I think I'll go to my closing. So, what we really need to do, if we are looking for this bright tech future, is we want to start thinking about our values. We're saying we want tech to be more ethical, but that also means we need to understand what we agree on is ethical versus unethical. What's appropriate, what's not appropriate, and also, if we can have that societal agreement about how we want to operate online, we need to be able to inject that into the process because right now it's currently disconnected. But I will say, since we did mention it, we're going to end this on a bright uh, tech future. Uh, as dark as it can get sometimes, you run into hundreds of people who are doing this as their, as their career, as their job, trying to kind of make a dent in this, trying to say, well, I have a background that has value to this. This is something that maybe we didn't think about. This is a different angle, right? Again, if we can lower the unintended consequences by actually debating what are likely consequences and how can we create that better tech future. So thank you, and we'll take, uh, I think, a few uh, questions here, so thank you. Do we have, uh, I think we're going to be using the mic uh, too, or I can go around too, or? Yeah, let's go with the mic. Uh, hello, I just want to thank you for being here and for speaking. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, kind of related to that question of, you know, who do we trust uh, more to, or, or who do we trust, who do we have like less issues trusting with regulating speech yeah. or the government or big tech? Um, I would like to ask, uh, what do you think of the proposition to break up big tech, and if it was broken up, how might that you know, affect that question of yeah. speech regulation? Yeah, yeah. obviously uh, breaking up tech was, was a big part of, or is, of uh, Elizabeth Warren's platform, and I think a few other candidates have, have kind of gone on to that. It goes back to, to power of what we're talking about. I think what we're realizing with breaking up big tech and that discussion around it is that the consolidation of power is, is frankly unsustainable and makes people uncomfortable. So personally, I would, I would argue that we need to focus on 
power and, and incorporating more voice within it. The problem specifically about trying to break up big tech uh, is that they're worried that any major kind of legal changes about how they operate might actually just uh, solidify the standing of some of these larger kind of tech companies. And that's frankly even what they're worried about with removing Section 230 is that if you're one of the larger tech companies, you might be able to afford that, that change. Uh, but to go to your point, uh, I, I think it is important to, to note that uh, as much as we're talking about innovation, uh, the actual innovation trends about new businesses are actually historically low, not historically high. And uh, you know, I think most people are kind of bothered by the fact that a lot of companies that could potentially have competed with some of the, the big tech companies uh, just get gobbled up. And I think specifically, I don't know if this is maybe what you're thinking about, but like a company like WhatsApp that was you know, bought and then within the Facebook family, the same thing for Instagram. Uh, obviously a lot of debate around if those had not been purchased, uh, would, would they be competing? Would you then have the choice of saying, well, I don't like Facebook's policy, I'm gonna go to Instagram if they were separate companies. Whereas right now, uh, they are a uh, Facebook family. I think, I think the government would have a, a tough time right now uh, separating them, because I think there's also been an intentional push to integrate all those platforms, even if you look specifically about how Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram uh, relate to one another. They have made them a lot tighter in the last year. Uh, you, you could also argue that if they're predicting that they could ever have this type of behavior of breaking it apart, that they're trying to integrate it to a point where it couldn't be broken apart. So, but yeah, it's a good question. It's a very hot debate. No, well, I think we're doing it for the recording. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you so much for coming out. Um, I did have a question more about yeah. All Tech is Human. Sure. Um, so you did mention that um, you have them right now in New York and yes. California. Um, is your hope or plan to expand that to more rural areas across the country? Yes. And can you speak to some of the challenges with that and also the opportunities that come with that as well? Yes. I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, that, that has been the case for, for expansion where, like it's like I mentioned, oh, it's New York, San Francisco, and Seattle. And as anybody could correctly point out, you say, well, those are all coastal, coastal cities. Uh, how do you expand outside of that? The challenge is that it, there, there always seems to be kind of a catch-22 with, with expansion, is that you need to have a certain concentration of, of uh, people within a certain space in order to kind of have something out there. I think that's been been a tricky part. And even specifically you know, on that idea, if we look at uh, what happened uh, over the recent year or two with the Amazon headquarters debate, uh, there was such a hot debate of saying, where is Amazon going to go? Wait, maybe they're going to choose uh, the heartland. Well, uh, they chose New York and then outside of uh, DC. Uh, so it was kind of interesting that that still happened you know, after, after all of that. Uh, debate, uh, but yeah, that that is kind of a, a hunger. Uh, what we're what we're looking to kind of do is more of a TED TEDx type of type of model that you could create a system that could be more turnkey. So I know sometimes you know on a personal level somebody will reach out and say, hey, you know, can you do this in Kansas City? So well, you know, that would take a, a significant amount of uh, resources in order to kind of take something and then transplant it. Whereas if it could be something where you get a, uh, an area person who, can be, who has those organizational types of skills, then I think it can, can scale a little differently. So yeah, yeah that's the, definitely the plan now. So. Any other thoughts or comments or questions? I wanted to jump quickly back to the issue of misinformation. Right? Sure. So when I talk to my students about this, which I do all the time, what they're all, they always say, well, shoot, if I were just smarter, if I were a better critical yeah. thinker, I wouldn't fall for these scams, right? And I try to point out to them, you're just one person. 
there's no way that you can understand all of this. And I, I frequently use the analogy of the Food and Drug Administration, mm -hmm. right? You can't possibly know every possible food that's safe to eat. So we have an agency that protects you from eating uh, food you shouldn't consume. What would an agency look like at the federal level to protect us from information yeah, we shouldn't well, consume? Yeah, well, they are kind of talking about that, <clears throat> to use that analogy of the FDA, right? You can't have this understanding, even though somebody says, well, you gotta be a safe eater. You don't have the understanding of, of, of where your lettuce traveled to, so you have an, <clears throat> an FDA. Uh, you know, I think we're, we're starting to see that uh, there's going to have to be some greater kind of integration of, of how they treat this. It's all over the map worldwide. So for example, <clears throat> in Germany, they created a law to say, okay, well this, if something is, is uh, false, that it has to be removed within a platform within uh, a certain period uh, of time or else then they get a big penalty. The problem that you, you have with misinformation is that we still need to have that trust, trust kind of source of saying, okay, here's how we clear a certain bar. Uh, I, I, I think it might be a little easier outside of misinformation where there's other issues like digital wellness that they're talking about creating some type of agency with because there's been a lot of struggles, uh, specifically on misinformation. There's a lot of tools that have been created in recent years, like NewsGuard is, is one of them, that will kind of give you a red light or green light through, through information. But what they have found is that for certain, uh, for certain individuals, they say, well, if they're, if they're saying I can't trust this, well then who is NewsGuard to then determine this? Uh, yeah, I do think that it, if it came from a governmental body, the tricky part would then be how would they be incorporated into a, a private company? Or are they given kind of more of a stamp of approval? Uh, I, I, where this is probably likely headed is that we seem to kind of be backing up in, from, from ex great expansion about where information is coming from to now actually coming from certain kind of vetted sources uh, so I would imagine that uh, if there was an agency where they could almost say, okay, we're giving this some level of ability to understand it. The tricky part is if any governmental agency gives a firm like stamp of approval, then it's going to be highly partisan. And, and then I think that's going to hit a lot of roadblocks. But it certainly is, a, is an area to point out. And something kind of along that lines that I would kind of mention, especially since we're, we're talking about critical thinking, is that this also, what's also shifting is that we cannot just, as you mentioned, we cannot just rely on that one individual, right? Because it used to be historically easier because if you're getting news from a major uh, newspaper, you knew that they had journalistic ethics and understanding and went through research practice of how they vetted their, their sources. So you could, you could uh, read that with a greater level of uh, you know, appreciation and understanding of the veracity of that, that information. Whereas I think it's, it's a little much for us to, to sh have shifted and say, well, this is where we just need to be better critical thinking. Don't share something until you do research around it. The reason why I say that is because the way that we design our platforms, it's in the complete opposite direction over being a thoughtful consumer, right? So if we're saying, read the article, check the who wrote it, make sure that it's not a duplicate fake site that stole an icon. Well, the way social media is also set up, it's to reward somebody for being first, right? And it's saying, oh my God, Kobe Bryant died? Like, as soon as I heard that, I said, wait a minute, is this really true, right? Because uh, they're so uh, shocking. But the point is, social media tends to move really quickly. So what, instead of an FDA agency, I think what is going to be more likely is the idea of reintroducing levels of friction. Because what they find is that technologists are obsessed with removing friction. They say, we want to go from your head to being said instantaneously. Facebook is even working on a computer brain interface that would take your thoughts and project them to the network. Wow, I wonder how that's going to go wrong. But um, the, point, the point is that completely goes against our understanding of how humans work. 
even when we think about a different area, and this is why this needs to be multidisciplinary, when we think about criminal law, you are not convicted of a crime unless the mental state and the act occur in some level of tandem. If you just think the worst thoughts that you've ever had, you will not be arrested because you have the, you have the freedom of mind. Whereas what, what social media platforms have done, which I think has led to a lot of these issues that we're not, now trying to solve, is they've basically said, how can I get a greater access to your initial thought? So it's the idea that a critical thinker is, is an owl, and our social media platforms are set up to appeal to the reptilian brain, right? So how do we then inject a level of friction that could, could say, let me think about this. Uh, there's a lot of great uh, innovation in that area. Rethink was done by a young entrepreneur outside of the Chicago area, uh, recently funded by um, uh, Mark Cuban and Shark Tank. And what they found was then, just by scanning the language and kicking it back to you, you would rethink what you, what you were gonna post. Likewise, for any level of misinformation, if there was something that, in, when you hit the share button, said, oh, let me just show you some other sources with this. Let me show you what there's an opinion about this. Let me give you a chance. Uh, that's going to be much more likely than any type of official yes, no, which I think people would find uh, too extreme. Well, we are going to say thank you well, thank very you. much, David. We appreciate it. And thank you all for braving the weather and joining us. <laughs> thank you. There we go. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Now Thank we're you.